Okay, so I guess let's start. Um, so we're going to continue talking about Bandit, but this time we're going to talk about a slightly more complicated and a more practical version of Bandit, which is called Contextual Bandit. So let's just do a quick recap on the uh, classic multi arm Bandit setting, right? And this is an interactive learning process where every day the learning system pulls an arm or an action from k many actions, right? So the learning algorithm strategy could be adaptive in the sense that you know the strategy is updated every time, every day, right? Based on the historical information. And then once the arm is determined or the action is picked, the learning algorithm will observe the corresponding reward that is ID sampled from that action's distribution. Right? And then you know we move on to the next day. And the way that we are measuring the learning process is this regret, right? So the first term on the right-hand side is the total expected reward, the maximum total expected reward that you would get if you pick the best arm every day, right? So this is our you know, benchmark. And the second term on the right-hand side is the expected total reward that our learning system got, right? Because this I subscript T is the action that we picked at day T, right? So this is measuring the difference between the maximum reward that you could get and you know, the total expected reward that you got, right? And we wanted this difference, this regret, it grows sublinearly in the sense that you know if you take average, this average regret goes to zero. Right? And we talked about two algorithms that achieves this goal. And one algorithm, the UCB algorithm, is the optimal algorithm in the sense that it achieves the optimal regret, which is square root t, if you still remember. Right? So this model is very classic. You know, lots of computer scientists, lots of mathematicians were studying this model. Right, because this is simple and it also has you know, good uh, practical usage as well. It's a very simple mathematical model. But the downside of this model is that what we assumed is that across all days, right, these actions distributions, they're fixed. Like the best arm, the best action is fixed every day, right? So nothing is changing. So this is one of the limitations. So let's see, you know, if we can actually make that model slightly more general, but incorporate contexts into this interactive learning process. Right. So the outline is the introduction of this new model, and then we're going to talk about a very simple algorithm, and then we're going to briefly mention the theory and you know some practical considerations of this approach. Okay. So that's the plan for today. Okay, so let's see the model, right? So again, this is an interactive learning process. And every day, different from the multi arm bandit setting, first of all, every day, at the beginning of every day, there's a new context, xt, that appears. So maybe you can think about this x space is embedded in some d-dimensional Euclidean space, right? So some feature, some context shows up every day. And based on the history information and the new context that, that we just saw today, right? So the learning algorithm gonna pick an action, AT, from the action set. Maybe there are K-many actions, right? So what's the difference between this model, this new model, and the previous multi arm bandit model, right? So the previous multi arm bandit model does not have the first step here, right? Here, every day, we are observing some context. And based on the context, we are recommending some action. Right? We're going to see an example in the next slide. But let's just quickly go through the framework for, for now. Right? And the next step is also important. So le the learning algorithm will observe and a reward for the corresponding action that it just recommend. Right? So in this case, the reward will actually be dependent on the context and the action you picked. 
Right? So this is a function that takes the context and the action you pick. Simple, right? So in other words, this model is richer than the multi unbanded model, right? Because here we are saying that for different contexts, because the reward function depends on context, right? For different contexts, the best arm, the best action might be different, right? So that is a model. Yeah, the difference is that every round, we're gonna make a decision based on slightly more information, slightly more you know, information from this context, right? And also we know that the reward function depends on the action and the context together now. So there's no sort of unique, you know, best action anymore, right? Because for different contexts, you know, the optimal action might be different. Yes, question? So um, given a context, is the distribution for um, like the reward and an action fixed? Yeah. So if so, I fix the, yeah. okay. So for this, for, today, for today's lecture, let's assume that everything is, the reward is deterministic. Right, so this is just a reward function. This is the usual REL reward, right? State action, then you know, deterministic reward on that state action. Because the challenge, the, the, the challenge in this contextual bandit setting is the challenge from this, this randomness on the context, not on the reward. You can extend this to the distribution, like stochastic reward, that is totally fine as we did you know, in the multi bandit setting. But for simplicity, let's assume reward is deterministic here. But how this context shows up every day, we're gonna assume some distribution. Okay, so basically you can think about this as you know, two components, right? And they're interacting with each other every day. So the environment every day proposes a context. The context is maybe in this case, I sampled from a distribution U and the algorithm sees this context Right, and recommends an action. And then the environment receives that action and return a feedback to the algorithm, right? How good your action is based on the current context. And this process repeats for many, many times. And the hope of the learning algorithm is that, you know, it can gradually improve its ability to recommend the actions, right? Okay, so, so basically all this personalized recommendation system is kind of using this framework, right? So here in this example, maybe the context is user's information. So when you design the system, what you would do is collect all the, hist all the information related to you know, a visitor that is visiting your website, right? So this uses, um, why am I, that was conditions. Sorry about that. Um, you know, the, all the historical, uh, you know, browser history, for instance, the user and the age, height, you know, weight, job type, or so on and so forth, right? So you can, you can imagine you can do this for personalized, you know, um, house treatment as well, right? So a doctor will basically look at the context of a patient. In this case, the context might be the history of the health conditions, so on and so forth, right? And then the decision in this case will be news articles. In the personalized health treatment, there will be just you know, new, new treatments. There's multiple new treatments based on the context of the user, you wanna recommend a particular treatment, right? So in this case, based on the, the user, the visitor of your website, you're trying to you know, display relative news articles for that user. And the goal here is, in this case, we wanna to learn to maximize the user's click rate, right? You propose you know, three articles, in the first page, you hope that the user actually clicks those articles, right? Rather than going to the second page or third page, so on and so forth, right? So you wanna propose more relevant articles at the very top of your list, right? So user clicks. So if user clicks the first article you, 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 you propose, that's great because what you propose is relevant to that user, right? But here, user have a context, right? So different user have different preference. So your recommendation system needed to figure out the correct policy, the strategy to recommend articles for different users, right? So the multi arm bandit setting does not capture this, right? Because it assumes that, you know, every user likes one particular article, right? There's no preference difference among users, but this is not really true in practice, right? And 
yeah, so that's what I said. The different users have different preference of when used, so need to personalize, right? So this also applies to those personalized health treatment, right? So you want to recommend a new treatment based on your patient's history information, right? And you propose a treatment and you hope that you receive positive response from that patient, right? So if that is the case, then you get a good reward. If, if, if it's not, then you get a negative reward, right? So your hope is that you can improve your next round's decision. Right. Any questions about the model? Okay. Now this, you can really think about this model as a Markov decision process with you know, time step at equal to one, right? So this is a finite horizon Markov decision process with at equal to one. So let's use X to represent our state space now, or you can call it context space, right? And A is our action space and then we have a reward function R and our time horizon H happens to be equal to one and we have a distribution over the initial state or the initial context right now, right? So the objective function is very simple. We sample the first context from this fixed distribution, right? And we wanna find a policy pi and then maximize the expected total reward, right? So the expectation is taken with respect to the distribution new, new and the reward is measured using this function R, right? Measured at the context, the sample from this distribution and the action you propose at this particular context, right? So this is just a reinforcement in the objective function with H equal to one, like it's one step. Yes, question? Why is H equals one? Um, like, don't we also like in the multi-arm bandit case have multiple rounds at the loan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do we assume there is that in the next round, your new context, is sampled from this new again. So there's no Markov transition. Oh, okay. Right, so like, like what, is, what is in RL, we assume that every episode you interact, you make actually many decisions, right? And then you reset to the initial state. Yeah. I see. Here, we're just making one decision. Every day, we just propose one decision. And on the next day, we just assume a new context arrives, right? That is also ID sampled from this distribution. Yep, that makes sense. Thanks. All right. So think about this as you know the LQR problem where every every like you only have you only need to make one decision. Right? You make one decision today, tomorrow you reset and you repeat. And we always assume that this context is sampled from this distribution here. Right. So there's no Markov in transition. So you make one decision, you receive a reward, you're done today. Tomorrow, let's repeat the process. Uh, you might have you might have mentioned this, but uh, is new a fixed distribution because like people's yes. preferences could change over time? Yeah. So mu is a distribution. R is fixed, right? So mu is also a fixed distribution. So what we assume is that there's a distribution over population, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, you know, my new patient is different from previous patient, but I assume that this is a sample from some unknown distribution, mm -hmm. right? And because every day, you know, this, this web recommendation system has been interacting with so many users, right? So it's reasonable to assume that the next user that the recommendation system saw is independent from the previous user, right? Mm -hmm. Because every day you're interacting with millions of users, right? Like, you know, every minute or every, you know, five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's why this ID assumption is reasonable. Okay, so yeah, so for simplicity, let's assume reward is deterministic and the challenge, as I said, is here is really from the randomness in the context. You know, we want to learn a policy pie that can recommend actions based on the context, right? 
Okay, so um, let's talk about the metric, how we can measure the performance of this learning process, right? So let's fix the policy class, pi. Now this is really the policy class that we use in reinforcement learning as well, right? So think about each pi in this policy class as a classifier that maps from the context x to an action a. x is from this contact space, a is from this action space. Right? So this is just the policy we use in reinforcement learning as well. Right? And again, this is a reinforcement learning problem with h equal to one. Right? And let's define the optimal policy pi star, which is the optimal policy that maximizes the, op the policy that maximizes the expected total reward, right? Expectation is taken with respect to the initial context from this mu and the reward function R. Right, so pi star is, you know, you search over all the policies in your policy class, pick the one that maximizes this expected total reward, right? So this is our objective function. All right, so like reinforcement learning, like policy gradient, every iteration, the learning system proposes some policy pi t, right? So recall the reinforcement learning the policy gradient approach, right? Every round, every round, every iteration, we are updating our policy from pi t to pi t plus one, right? So here, every iteration, you know, we are updating from a policy pi t to pi t plus one, and we recommend action a t based on our policy pi t, measured at today's context x t, right? And then we receive a reward that is you know, the value of the reward function measured at today's context xt and the action we proposed, right? And the regret is again, you know, the difference between two quantities, right? So the first quantity is the expected total reward if we always place, if, if we always use the optimal policy pi star to recommend actions, right? So this is like, you know, the ground truth optimal policy in ARIA, right? Like the policy that maximizes the expected total reward across t many rounds. Right? And the, the second term is the expected total reward of our learned sequence of policies. Right? So remember every day we propose a policy and we recommend action based on that policy. So let's just measure you know, what's the expected total reward that we would have got if we're using this sequence of policies. Right? So the first term is the best we could get and the second term is what we got. So the difference of them, difference between them, you know, again, we call it regret. And as you can imagine, the goal is to make the regret grow sublinear, right? So that in average, the average regret approach to zero. Okay, so that is the setting. Um, any questions for this setting? <laughs> Right, so really you can think about this as a Markov decision process, reinforcement learning problem with h equal to one, right? So for instance, whatever you implemented for policy gradient, the natural policy gradient algorithm, you can apply it here. Policy gradient still applies, right? Just set h equal to one. And think about this mu as your initial state distribution, right? So you can do policy gradient here. You can do natural policy gradient here. Okay, so if there's no question, then let's jump into the second component. All right, so we're gonna talk about a very simple algorithm. So this will be very similar to the explore and commit algorithm that we talked about for multi-unbanded. Okay, so there are two components that I wanna mention. So the first component is this importance weighting. So we have seen this importance weighting in policy gradient as well, right? And we have seen that in one of the homework problems where you know, we ask you to prove that importance weighting actually is kind of magic. It gives you some unbiased estimate of, you know, something that you haven't tried, right? So what do you mean here? Let me remind you, you know, what this importance weighting is. So remember the key challenge in Bandit, in Maltian Bandit, and also in this contextual Bandit, is that every round, we only can recommend one action, right? And we recommend an action, we observe the reward of that action. So 
we can get a sense of how good that action is, but we don't know if the actions that we haven't tried, right? We don't know if they are good or not. Like we tried something, right? But we don't know, you know, if the, there's some action left that we haven't tried, how good they are or how bad they are, right? We don't know if the action that we tried is actually the best action or not, conditioned on this context, right? So that's the problem of multi-arm bandit. And that's the problem for this contextual bandit as well. So importance weighting is kind of magic here and it allows us to actually get an unbiased estimate of all the actions, right? Even if you only tried a particular action. <laughs> Okay, so let's see how, how it works. This is really the homework problem. So I'm just really gonna repeat the homework problem it's conclusion for you again. Okay, so let's see at every round T, I'm sampling an action AT based on distribution over action space. All right, let's, let's not worry about how the distribution is constructed. Let's just sample an action from this distribution, maybe a uniform distribution, who knows, right? And let's lock the probability of this action under this distribution. So we, we, we sample an action and we log the probability of this action being sampled from this distribution. And we propose this action and we receive the reward for respond, corresponding to that action. Okay, so now we get a good, now we get the reward for the action that we proposed. But again, as I said, we don't know the reward of the actions that we haven't proposed, right? So let's use the importance weighting to get an estimate of the rest of the actions reward. So this is the quantity that you saw, you've already seen in the homework problem, right? So for all action A, not just the action you proposed, right? For actions that are different from the action you proposed, we can define a scalar for that action, which looks like you know this, that has three components, right? So the reward of this particular action and an indicator function shows that if this action is equal to the action that you just tried, right? If it is, it's one, otherwise it's zero. And then that's, you know, importance weighted by the probability of the action AT. Okay, so this looks complicated, but picture-wise, this is exactly what I'm doing. Right, so this is the entry corresponds to AT. So I'm putting zero everywhere, right? Because this indicator function says that for action A does not equal to AT, this value is zero, right? Because indicator is gonna give you a value zero. So all I'm doing is put zero everywhere, right? On, in this picture, I'm putting zero everywhere, except the entry that corresponds to the action that you sampled AT, right? If that is the case, you know, what's the reward for that entry, right? So it is the reward of AT over the probability of AT being picked from this distribution. Right? So this equation looks complicated, but when you translate to do this picture, this is very simple. I put zero everywhere and accept this entry, um, you know, importance weighted by the probability of this being sampled. Okay, so the claim is that this reward vector is an unbiased estimate of the reward vector, the, the ground truth reward vector. So what do I mean? The expected value of this R hat at any action A is actually equals to the reward at this context XT measured at action A. Right, so this is what you proved in the homework as well. Right, so what I'm saying is that this quantity expectation of hat R is actually equals to R X T you know, for all action. Like this is kind of magic, right? So you just try to one action, you just log, log to the probability of this action being sampled. And then you just write out this long vector that you, and you put zero everywhere, except the entry that corresponds to AT, right? You write down the number, which is the ratio of you know, RT, and the probability of AT being picked. That's it. 
And what we're claiming here is that this is an unbiased estimate of the whole reward vector. All right, so let me just quickly remind you how you know the proof goes. All right, so let's just consider a particular action A, right? So this A does not have to be equals to AT. So remember AT is a sampled action, right? So what is the randomness in this, this factor? So the randomness is from So the randomness is from the sample to action AT, right? So if I tomorrow I repeat this process, I sample another AT, you know, this, this vector will be different, right? So the randomness is only coming from AT. So this, this vector is a random vector, right? Because it depends on AT. And AT is sampled from my distribution. So which means that I'm going to reason about the expectation of AT from this distribution P of hat R of A, right? So this is just the left-hand side of this, this expression. So I'm trying to quantify the expected value of this estimator measured at the action A, right? So remember the goal is to show this is equals to R of X, T and A. That was our goal, right? So I'm just writing out the expectation definition, right? Sum over A, T from all the actions and the probability of AT being sampled from this distribution P, right? So this part is equals to expectation of AT from P. Okay, great. I have an indicator function here, right? So the indicator only fires if AT is equal to A. So this means that, you know, the rest of the terms goes away because the indicator will be zero. Right, if and only if when AT equals to A, you know, I have this quantity left, right? The indicator function fires. Right? Otherwise, you know, the term will just be zero, right? So all I left is you know AT equal to A. So now this cancels, this gives us the article, uh, the, the, the quantity that we want. Right, so what we just proved is expectation of AT from P hat R A is indeed equals to potentially this unknown quantity, right? Because we haven't tried A. Remember this conclusion holds for any A from this action set, not just the action you have picked, but the action you haven't picked as well. Right, so this is this is this is the importance weighting trick. Now, if you pick an action deterministically, you we will not be able to do that. Okay, so in some sense, you want to do some sort of a random trial, and you want to get a good estimate of you know something that you haven't you didn't try. Okay, so this kind of this this importance weighting trick has been used in so many places in those clinical trials. Right, so that's why you know we often do randomized trial in these cases, right? So we don't deterministically assign this treatment to a patient. Like we often flip a coin, right? So this is just, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. I had a quick question. Um, how do we exactly log P sub D of A? Um, we're assuming we don't know the distribution P, right? Yeah, so, so we will see that when we talk about the algorithm, right? But this is your, your job to determine this probability. Right. So you had the, 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 the recommendation system, right? So you design the distribution over actions and you sample in an action from there, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So then you record down the probability of your sample, right? So this is also corresponding to this randomized trial, right? So a patient shows up. You don't want to deterministically assign that treatment to, to, to that patient, right? Especially at the stage where you're doing clinical trial, right? So you figure out a distribution and you actually flip a coin based on this distribution which determines whether or not you want to give the treatment to, 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 to the patient or you want to give some other treatment to the patient, right? And you record on the probability of your decision, right? Because you do want to do importance weighting, right? So you want to get an unbiased estimate of, you know, what would happen if I proposed another treatment, right? 
at least in expectation, I know that this, this is going to be unbiased estimate. Okay, but the bottom line here is that by using importance weighting, we get an unbiased estimate of you know, the reward for all actions, including the action that we haven't tried, right? So that seems the good news, right? So we get rid of one challenge from multi unbanded we do importance weighting, we get an unbiased estimate of the actions you know, we haven't tried. So it's kind of, you know, get it for free, right? Okay, so another component that I wanna talk about is this reward sensitive classification. So this will generalize the classification problem that you saw from you know, the introduction to machine learning class. So let's first recall what is classification, right? So we have a data set where this is a feature, right? So in the usual classification setting, I have a data set that consists of feature and the label pairs. This is label. In our case, we have a finite number of labels. We have a many labels. So let's say we are doing a many, you know, uh, class classification. Right, so what we are doing here in classification, right? So we are trying to find a policy pi that, you know, minimize the classification error, right? So in other words, you know, maximize the sort of the, uh, so maximize the, the rate of, you know, hitting the correct label in the training data. So this says that the label that you proposed from your classifier pi match to the ground truth stable in the training data, right? So this is equivalent to you know, minimizing the classification error, right? Okay, so what I just said is max over pi Right, so minimizing the classification error to training classification error. This is equivalent to you know maximizing you know the sort of the consistency between your predict predictions and the ground truth tables. Right. Okay, so that is classic super class classic classification problem in supervised learning setting. Let's make it a slightly more general. Right. So let's generalize to the reward sensitive setting. So what do I mean by reward sensitive? So again, I have a data set that consists of feature and some sort of reward pair, right? So this is still the feature, right? feature vector. Okay, so now instead of showing you a label, I'm showing you a vector whose length is actually the number of labels. So in other words, instead of telling you the ground truth label, I'm showing you that for this example, different label have different reward. Right, maybe label one has reward one, label two has reward zero, label three has reward you know, 0 0.5, right? So when you do classification, you get a reward signal as well. So we're sort of weighting different label, labels using, diff, using weights. So let's, let's sign a picture. This is a picture of a data set, right? So I have a feature and then I have a, this long vector where every label has its own reward R, I. So this is reward for label one, right? So every label we have associated reward. So why do I why did I say this generalized the classification setting? Because if you can think about the, the classic classification setting as this reward sensitive classification, except that this reward vector will be a one hot indicator function, right? So you have reward one for the ground truth label, and you have reward zero everywhere. Right, so what do you mean? So you can translate this as an indicator function that has zero, zero everywhere, maybe one, zero, zero everywhere, right? And your one corresponds to the ground truth stable I. Right, so you can think about the classic classification as the special case of this reward sensitive classification. 
right? So the objective function is still the same. I want to find a policy, a classifier that achieves the highest total reward across these training examples, right? So you make a classification. So you, you, you map from the feature to a label, and then you look at the associated reward for that label, right? And then you sum them together over all the examples. So you're mapping that. So again, the objective function in the classic classification is just a special instance of you know, this reward sensitive classification, right? Think about the reward vector as this one hot you know, vector. There you have zero everywhere except one at the ground truth label. Right, so here I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, actually just gen generalize the classification a little bit more to this reward sensitive classification. Wait, so just to clarify, this summation returns one full vector, right? No, so yeah, so this, this R I is the value in the entry. Oh, uh, okay, vector. I see, I see, okay. Yeah, so this is R1, right? So this is the value in the first entry. So, you know, this reward sensitive classification is also pretty common in practice, right? So imagine you wanna do classification over many, many labels, right? So there might be cases where, you know, two labels, they're equally good. So you can actually use reward sensitive classification here by designing a reward function that has zero everywhere, right? But have one, reward one, on the two labels that you believe are equally good. In the sense that, you know, your classifier can classify to any of these, these two good labels, doesn't matter, they're equally good. Right, so that's totally possible. Like if you have millions of items to classify, maybe there are top five that are equally good. So you just put one, one, one for these top five labels and the rest is zero, right? Or you believe there's a ranking among these labels, then you can design a reward function that reflects the, the ranking of the, on these labels, right? So this, by, in, by, by incorporating this reward vector that really uh, generalizes the classification problem, right? So it allows us to, you know, uh, do, for instance, this multi-label classification problem, where you believe there are multiple labels that are equally good for this example. Okay, so, so um, we will actually do a reduction to this classification, to this supervised learning problem. I, again, we will design an algorithm that every round uses this reward-sensitive classification oracle. Okay, so just summary so far. So what we talked about are two components that we're gonna use in the algorithm. The first component is importance weighting. So we magically get unbiased estimator for all actions, including the ones that we haven't tried. All right, so this is the procedure. You randomly sample an act. You design a distribution, you randomly sample that action from that distribution. You log down the probability of this action being picked. You receive the reward for that action. Now you write down this, 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 this long vector, right? that puts zero everywhere except the entry that corresponds to the action you picked. And you put down this ratio, R over the probability of this action being picked. Right, and you take expectation with respect to the vector, you get an unbiased estimate of the entire reward vector. And the second component is this generalized classification problem, right? So now you have reward function, you have reward for each label. And your goal is to maximize this, maximize the reward, total reward across these training examples. All right, just think about the classic classification as a special case of this, where the reward vector is a one hot vector, right? You have zero everywhere except the one at the places where, at the, at the entry that corresponds to the ground truth stable. Right, so then, you know, this is just special case of this reward sensitive classification. Okay, so we're going to use these two components to design the algorithm. And you will see the algorithm is actually very simple. All right, so let's put two things together. Um, so we call it explore and ex explore and commit again. So as you can imagine, we're gonna have designed two phases. The first phase is just your exploration. 
right? So, of course, the first step is, you know, we just wait for a new observation come or new context come. So xt is sample from this unknown distribution new in the ID fashion, right? So we saw in the context, let's propose some action. And in the exploration phase, what we're going to do is actually uniformly random sample in action. Okay, so this notation represents uniform distribution over the action set A. All right, like this is essentially saying that let's not worry about reward. Let me just uniformly random something. Let, let me just uniformly randomly pick a treatment for a patient, for instance, right? Let's just do like, you know, completely random, you know, clinical trial, for instance, for now. All right, and I receive a reward of the random action that I picked. Okay, so the benefit of doing random exploration is that now we can use this to form an important weighting, right? We can get an unbiased estimate of the actions that we actually haven't tried. So in other words, let's use importance weighting to form an unbiased estimate of all the actions. Right, so this is for all A, this action set. You know, again, this thing is that for A does not equal to the action that we picked, we put zero there, right? For the action A that is equals to the action that we picked, let's put down this ratio, right? Which is the reward of that action over the probability of this action being picked. Now, what's the probability of this action being picked? It is one over the size of A, right? Because we do uniform random. Okay, so again, remember this picture, right? We have zero everywhere except this guy. And in our case, PAT is nothing but one over A, right? Because we're doing uniform random. Like nothing is, we are using, you know, the, the most simple, the simplest distribution, right? Uniform random. So the probability of this action being picked is one over the size of the actions, action space. Okay, so this is a picture. So we do this every round for a while. Every round we form this unbiased estimate vector, right? Using importance weighting. Okay, great. At the end of this exploration phase, what we have, right? So we have a data set that consists of XI, the context at I's round, and the reward vector. Right, so this is our data set. So this data set looks like a data set that can be used for reward sensitive classification, right? So we have feature XI and we have a reward vector whose length is equal to the number of actions, the number of labels, right? So this vector is saying that we have different rewards for different labels. Okay, so the next step is actually just apply the reward sensitive classification on this data set. So again, this is a data set right, for reward sensitive classification. So this step says that let's try to find a policy pi that maximizes the total reward on this data set. Right, so why this step is making sense? Right, because our xt is sampled from this distribution, right? And our r hat is an unbiased estimate of the true reward at context xt, right? So in expectation, this objective function In your expectation, it is approximating the objective function that we care. Right? So we have two random sources, right? So we have context, but we know that context, all these contexts, they are ID sampled from this distribution U, right? So let's just replace all this summation over all context by the expectation over this context from this distribution view. And then inside the expectation, 
In our objective function, we have this R hat, but we know that R hat is an unbiased estimate of the ground truth reward, right? So that's why we can put an R here. So basically we are saying that after we collect many, many examples, and after we make all the reward factor, this estimate unbiased, now we are really trying to use this data set to approximate the objective function, right? Again, there are two random sources. The first random source is from context, but all our, our context, they are ID sampled from this distribution mu, right? So when I'm aggregating over this context, I'm approximating the expectation over the context distribution, right? And my reward vector is unbiased. It is unbiased estimate of the ground truth reward, right? So if you add expectation, you can show this objective function is an unbiased estimate of the ground truth objective function. Okay, so we are back to supervised learning problem right now, right? So we have an objective function that is formulated from a data set. And we know everything is unbiased. So that is great. You know, if we have more data set, if we have more data points on that data set, we know that our training loss is actually going to be equal to the expected loss that we care about. Right, so again, here, this, this reward sensitive classification oracle is approximately optimizing our ultimate objective function, right? Because we make sure everything is unbiased, right? We make sure, you know, the, the, the context, the, the ID sample from this unknown distribution, we make sure the reward vector is an unbiased estimate of the ground truth reward, right? So we do all this work and we make sure everything's unbiased. Okay, so the second phase is very simple. Let's just do exploitation. After we get this good policy pi hat, Let's just propose actions based on this policy pi hat, right? So remember the explore and the commit phase in multi unbanded. Once we explore it, we're just gonna commit to the best thing that we found. So here we explore it first, and then we find the best policy, the best empirical policy that maximizes you know, the, the, the total reward across the exploration data set. And then we commit to this policy, right? Later on, we just pick an action. We recommend an action based on this policy, that's it. We're never gonna do any update. So one thing I wanna emphasize again is one over M sum over I equal to zero from <clears throat> N minus one. Right, so this is really approximating the expectation of x over nu r x pi x, right? So the training objective function is the average over these data points, right? And the average is really approximating the expected reward. The yeah. action space is like really large. Yeah, yeah, you will see it in, uh, yeah, it will. Okay. Yeah, but same thing would happen for classification, right? So like, you, if you do a classification with 1000 labels, of course the problem is much harder than, you know, doing binary classification. Is there a UCB version of this algorithm? There is. And it, it, there's many, uh, yeah, optimism in the face of uncertainty version of this algorithm, but we're not going to talk about it. that's that's really complicated. Uh, yeah. One reason that I like this algorithm is this is a very simple algorithm. And as I was as I will mention, approaching the end of this lecture, there's a like very practical version of this algorithm, and it is actually being used in real systems as well. Like there exists UCB based algorithm that is very complicated and achieves better regret in theory than this approach. But in practice, this approach often does pretty well for most of the cases. Right. And this approach is very simple. Like all you need computation wise is this cost sensitive, reward sensitive classification, right? So this is just a slightly generalization of multi-class classification. Like you can just write down this objective function, do gradient descent on your, on your policy pi, or do gradient ascent in this case, right? 
and find the policy pipe that maximizes this data set, the, the objective function formulated on this data set. Like this pie could be a decision tree, this pie could be a SVM, this pie again could be you know, a neural net, right? Because all we're doing is that once we do exploration, like we form a supervised learning data set, right? That consists of features and reward, uh, reward vectors. One, like the reward vector, each, each reward in the vector corresponds to the reward for that label. Right. At the end of the day, we just formulated a classification data set and we run some reward sensitive classification algorithm on it. Right. And then we just commit to that policy. Now, of course, you know, in order to prove that this algorithm work, we have to, again, tune this parameter N like we did in the explore and commit sense, right? Okay, so any questions about the algorithm? Great. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about what guarantee it has. We're not gonna prove this one. We're just gonna, you know, try to get a sense of whether or not it, it can work in theory, right? So for simplicity, let's assume our policy class pi is discrete. Okay, but this could be exponentially large. We have a policy class that is really large, but let's just assume this is discrete for now. It doesn't really matter. You can replace this policy pi by a continuous policy class, but you're gonna use, you know, for instance, things like VC dimension to quantify the complexity of this class, right? So again, this is just a class of classifiers, right? So it has a well-defined VC dimension, for instance, right? But let's not worry about that for now. So let's just assume this is discrete, but this could be exponentially large. Right, so the theorem that we can get from this algorithm is that with high probability, if we properly set the hyperparameter n, I'm not gonna even tell you what n is, but there exists a hyperparameter that you can tune, like we did in the explore and commit algorithm for multi-unbanded. And once you set that n properly, you can get the following regret. Right? So the difference between the maximum total reward that you would get and the total expected reward that you got from the sequence of the policies you computed scales in this order. So this looks very similar to the regret that we have for explore and commit in multi right? And times the complexity of our policy class. So as I said, you can easily replace this by VC dimension of pi, but let's, let's not worry about that, right? So, so the key message here is that, again, this is a sublinear. Right, in the sense that capital T over T is roughly equals to K one over three T to the negative one over three. Okay, as T approaches to infinite, average regret approaches to zero. Right, so this is great. This means that this simple algorithm is actually doing almost as good as you know the best policy pi star in a long, in a in, in a long run. Right. Okay, so I think the details here are not super important. You know, the key message here is that this algorithm actually works in theory, right? So, but you have to do some extra work to tune the parameter. And, you know, you have to do some extra work to analyze the performance of this reward sensitive classification, right? But that's all doable. You know, reward sensitive classification at the end of the day is just a supervised learning problem, right? So you just transfer, you know, the supervised learning guarantee back to the guarantee in this bounty and bandit problem, in this contextual bandit problem. Okay, great. Now let's talk about some practical consideration, right? So we really wanna make this explore and commit algorithm work for in, in practice, for instance. Now set a hard threshold between exploration and exploitation seems pretty bad, right? So is there a way that we can sort of interleave this exploration and exploitation during the learning process? So there's a common trick people do, which is called epsilon greedy. So we do epsilon greedy even in reinforcement learning as well. 
so in high level, what this is. So this is that with probability one minus epsilon. So epsilon is a number from zero and one. Okay, so the first thing is that with probability one minus epsilon, I'm gonna pay action based on my policy. So maybe let's call it exploitation. Okay, so with probability one minus epsilon, I'm just doing whatever I'm supposed to do. Okay, I'm doing exploitation. With small probability epsilon, let's do exploration. So let's call this exploration. So every round, let's use this epsilon greedy exploration strategy. Let's flip a coin with probability one minus epsilon. I'm playing the action that I'm supposed to play based on my policy, right? I'm doing exploitation. Okay, with the rest of the probability, let's forget about what I have. Let me just do randomized trial, right? Let me just randomly pick an action from uniform distribution and I, I, I propose that action. Okay, so every round we interleave this exploration exploitation, right? So we, we, we depend on this randomness, this one, this epsilon greedy randomness to determine whether we do exploration exploitation. Right, so every round we do this. And the action distribution induced by this epsilon greedy at iteration T is essentially the distribution between these two mixture, between these two distributions, right? So this is actually a mixture distribution with probability one minus epsilon. We are playing this delta distribution, right? So delta over A is a delta distribution that you know you put zero zero everywhere but probability one for this particular action right? so this is a delta distribution in the sense that you put probability mass on a particular action so in this case you put probability one on the action that proposed by your policy right so this is a delta distribution if you sample an action from that distribution it's always going to sample the action from pi t right because you put prob all the probability mass one on that particular action and with probability, the rest of the probability epsilon, you just sample an action from uniform distribution, right? So again, this is just a mixture of two distributions. One is the delta distribution. The other one is the uniform distribution, right? With probability one minus epsilon, you're picking the action that proposed by pi t. With epsilon, you're proposing a random action, right? So in the extreme case, when epsilon approaches to zero, you just are doing exploitation. Right. When epsilon approach to one, you just do uniform exploration. Right. Of course, you need to tune that parameter in both theory and in practice to get uh, you know the sweet spot for doing this. All right. So let's put this into the algorithm. Right. So every uh, now our algorithm can actually run from you know zero to infinite. Right, let's just keep the algorithm running every day, right? Never stop it. So every day we observe a context. And let's use the epsilon greedy to form an action distribution, right? Again, this is a mixture distribution with probability one minus epsilon. You're gonna lessen to your policy pi t, right? And with probability, sorry, with probability one minus epsilon, you're gonna lessen to your policy pi t. With probability the epsilon, you're gonna do a uniform exploration. You're gonna sample an action uniform randomly from this uniform distribution, All right? So you have this distribution playing an action AT from this distribution PT, All right? And you observe the reward for that action. Okay, great. Let's use importance weighting to form an unbiased estimate at RT, right? Again, what's the picture? The picture is zero, zero everywhere, except to one place you have RT over PTAT and zero, zero everywhere. This is our vector. So picture wise, zero everywhere, one place, the, the place corresponding to the action you played, you have this ratio, right? You have this importance weighted number. At the end of the day, at the end of the T state, let's just do a reward sensitive classification update, right? Let's aggregate all the data that we have so far from day zero to the current day, 
apologize for this notation error. Let's just do a reward sensitive classification, right? So this, at the end of the day, we aggregate all the data that we have. Let's do a big, you know, supervised learning optimization. And tomorrow, you know, we're gonna use that new policy and we repeat, right? So in practice, you can also gradually decay the epsilon as well, because eventually you realize that, hey, I don't need to do two bunch of exploration, right? Because my policy is pretty good so far. Like when you observe, you know, whatever action you proposed, users just like it, right? So at this stage, you can gradually decay in your epsilon because you realize that my system is doing pretty well so far. I don't really need to do exploration anymore, right? Maybe the policy that I computed has already pretty much converged to the optimal policy, right? Now, of course, you know, epsilon is a hyperparameter, you know, like hyperparameters in many machine learning models, we do have to spend time tuning it, right? So, so like, if you want to deploy a machine learning system, there's no way that you can magically, you know, figure out a correct hyperparameter, right? We have to tune. Okay, so this is a much more practical version than you know, the explore and the committed that we talked about, right? So here we interleave exploration and exploitation, and we rely on some small probability of doing exploration. You now with probability epsilon, we do exploration, right? And we just do use the very simple uniform exploration strategy. Nothing is even you know, fancy here, right? And you know, at the end of the day, we just do a big update, right? So this is like, you, know, you, you, you shut down your system, every night you know, for, for like 10 minutes or one hour, you do this big optimization, right? Optimization over the entire data set that you collected so far, right? And then you, you know, update the policy for, for, for the next day and you repeat every day. Okay, so this simple algorithm is actually a popular algorithm that people use in practice. So one of the application that Microsoft is doing is this. So they, they sort of making this contextual bandit algorithms as a easy to use software such that, you know, people can actually sort of build, for instance, a recommendation system using their service. All right, so let's see what they are trying to do here. All right, so that's the framework that they proposed and what they focus on is just design this algorithm for you, right? So inside this box, this is running, for instance, the Epsilon greedy approach that we talked about, right? So let's see, you know, we, our customer, we customer, we are running, we are using this service. So let's see, you know, we are running some maybe bookstore, online bookstore, right? And we build some website that interacts with, you know, visitors, users. And our job is actually to recommend relevant books for different visitors, right? The hope is that we recommend relevant books on our website whenever a visitor comes. And our hope is that the visitor clicks, you know, the, the book that we visited, uh, we proposed, right? Or buy the book that we, we proposed. Okay, but, you know, we are just a, a, a bookstore website designer. We don't know anything about Contextual Bandit, right? So we can actually use their service. So what we do is that we design a website that extracts the context of a user. Every day, a new visitor comes for our website. Let's extract the feature of that user as much as we could, right? Whatever information that they provided when they register you know, their account here, for instance, right? And we're gonna record down you know, the information they have. You know, we're also probably gonna record down the, 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 the history book, the historical book that, that the user visited or checked so far, right? So this is the context. And our website needed to figure out you know, the relevant maybe 100 or 200 books. So this is the action set, right? And for each action, we also maybe featureize it, right? So maybe this is the feature of this particular book and that is the feature of you know, another book. So once we have this action set and we have the context for the user, now we can leverage that service, right? So we just feed these information to this service. And from this service perspective, it just saw a context and a set of actions, right? Like, the service does not need to know that we are running you know, a, a bookstore website or something, right? So the service just 
based on this rank API, it stores the user information, the context, a vector, and a set of potential actions. Now, this service runs some contextual bandit algorithm, and it proposes you know, some action. Right? So in this case, it gives you maybe it proposes the top three actions, for instance. So in our case, this corresponds to the top three books that we're going to display on our web website, for instance, right? So let's say, you know, we, we display the top three books to the user. And the user saws this top three recommended books. And then it's going to maybe click it or not click it, right? Like it or not like it, buy it or not buying it. OK, so based on that information, our job as a web designer is, is to design a reward scoring system. Right, that sort of scores this behavior. So, for instance, if the user buys the book that I recommended, I give reward a one for this particular action. If they click it, I give them reward 0 0.8, maybe. If they don't click it, if they don't like it, all the solutions that we proposed, just gonna give reward zero. Right, once you score it, you just send the number as a scaler back to this service through this reward API. Right? And then this API probably, sorry, this personalized service probably just going to run this contextual greedy, Epsilon greedy algorithm to update its policy, right? And now you can repeat. So this is actually the service that they built. And I can safely tell you that the Epsilon greedy algorithm that we talked about is playing an extremely important role in this, in this, in this service. So they have some other fancy, uh, you know, more advanced algorithm as well. But at the bottom is that most of the time they're just running this epsilon greedy algorithm, right? So once you realize the epsilon greedy algorithm is not doing super well, then they switch to some more advanced algorithm. But in a lot of cases, the epsilon greedy algorithm is just doing really well. Right, so now, you know, if you wanna build a recommendation system, or if you want to build some, uh, you know, whatever system that corresponding to you know picking an action based on some user context or whatever, we can use their service, right? So we don't need to be an expert on machine learning. We don't need to be an expert on um, contextual bandit, right? So all we need to do is just design these APIs, right? How to convert user information into a context vector how to convert you know, book information into a set of actions, you know, use their API to feed this information to the service. And then how can, how can we convert the action recommended from this service back to the box, corresponding box, right? And then we'll, the last step is to design a reward scoring system that scores the behavior of the user, right? Whether or not the user is gonna click it or whether or not the user is gonna buy the book, you know, we're gonna design a scoring system for that behavior. And the last step is just to send back this numerical scalar, this reward, right? Back to the system through this reward API. That's it, right? We don't need to worry about, you know, what's happening inside this personal service. Right, any questions about this application? So this system is running on this Microsoft Azure. Everyone can use it. I think it, I don't think it's free, but everyone can use it, right? Everyone can use that service. So the bottom line is that you don't need to be an expert on machine learning. You don't even need to be you don't need to be an expert on contextual bandit, right? So, you know, every web designer, every every you know, everyone who's interested in running some recommendation system for their application could actually just use their service. Right? At the end of the, in the in the, inside of this this service, they're running some contextual bandit algorithm. Right. Most likely it's running Epsilon Greedy for your application. But they have some strategies to switch to more advanced algorithms as well. So you mentioned uh, featurizing these actions. How does that affect the Epsilon Greedy algorithm? Yeah, so for Epsilon Greedy, it doesn't really matter, right? So for Epsilon Greedy, because with probability Epsilon, you still just randomly pick in an action, right? So you have 100 books, you just randomly sample an integer from 0 to 100. Mm -hmm. And then you recommend that action. Yeah, so how does the algorithm change if you use like these features for the actions? I don't... Yeah, so, so one thing you can do is 
uh, so when you implement, for instance, when you implement the reward sensitive oracle, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing you could do is actually fit a function that maps from context and action to the reward, right? Because you have a reward vector for different contexts, right? So you can actually learn a mapping that maps from a pair of context and the action to the corresponding reward signal using the data that you have, right? I see. Okay. So how are you going to use the action? Just concatenate the feature of the context and the feature of the action, right? Makes sense. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture.